Goodwill Games in New York City. And when Carter arrived, I was to take him to the stage to join a few other folks, including the likes of Ted Turner and Rudy Giuliani. They were there to all kick off the Goodwill Games, this big event. And on their way to the stage, a young girl who was a standout second grader at an inner city school approached President Carter to say hello. And you would have thought that the world stopped for Jimmy Carter. He knelt down to get a good look in the eyes of this young girl and he began this long series of questions about the subject she was studying and what her favorites were. When she said that math and science were among her favorites, Carter lit up. He smiled and he acted as if, as if she was the only one there. He didn't talk to her like she was just simply some kid. There wasn't condescension in his voice or there wasn't an air of let's hurry up and get to this photo op because, you know, I'm a big deal and i got to move along. It was one man talking to the future generation and coming from a place of deep empathy and compassion. And he cared about how not only we leave this planet, but how we leave it to the lives of those who will carry on. It was truly his faith in action. Now, Noel says that he began to get extremely nervous because they were calling from the stage for Carter to hurry up and get there so they could begin because now they were late. But Carter was just chill, is what Noel said, refusing to rush this important moment with this young girl. Now this is a great example of the way in which Jimmy Carter really lived his life, and it certainly highlights his humility okay, and his compassion. And accounts like this, they actually help renew our admiration, right, of good leaders. We love these stories. We love these accounts. And being honest this morning, it also, you know, reveals our disappointment in our much more polarized, unapologetic, or arrogant political scene we find ourselves in today. See, true examples of Christ-like humility have a way of rekindling our faith. They remind us of what is most valuable, specifically how we live in our lives here. And then how important it is to make sure that we keep our pride, our self-importance in check. See, when we hear about or we encounter these events, we are also encouraged to be humble. We're encouraged to be caring and to think of others more than we think of ourselves. Now, as excellent of an example as Jimmy Carter set during his lifetime, President Carter would agree that we have an even greater model in Jesus Christ for what it looks like to live a life of true humility. So today, we will take the opportunity to learn from that example of Jesus. Let me remind you, he's the king of kings, right? Who humbled himself, suffering terribly, suffering humiliation, yet conquering evil and death, all so that we might have abundant life. So to begin with today, I want us to take a quick look at a passage from the Apostle Paul. This is out of Philippians chapter 2. We'll begin with the first three, well, three through five here to begin. You'll see it here on the screen. It says this, Paul pens, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Pause for a second. You see, here Paul's encouragement is for believers to be like Christ. For our attitudes to be like His. Our actions to mirror His. And as you think about that, if you've been in church a long time, I affectionately call myself a church brat. I've been in church my whole life. Okay, That sounds good, but as we actually sit with what Paul is reminding us, really, that's one of those things that, sure, that's a lot easier said than done, right? 
I mean, Jesus is the very Son of God. But Paul doesn't allow us to kind of back off of that, to, to make a, what I would call a lame excuse in this case. As he then goes on to list out the actions and the attitudes that all believers should emulate and participate in. He continues on. We'll pick it back up in five so we catch that again. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So let's break down just a couple of these specifics that Paul identifies in Jesus. And I think these are ones that we could all likely agree are parts of not only just living a good life, they are a part of living a Christ-like life. So one of the first ones he says is don't take advantage of our position. Said other ways, we might say something like, don't lord yourself over people. I would say, don't force others into submission. See, many of us are or will be in a, a leadership type position in some area of life at some time. We will all have opportunities to take advantage of that. More, more pointedly, we will have opportunities to take advantage of other people. But Paul is reminding us here that Jesus had all the power. He had all the opportunity in the world to use his status to his advantage, and he didn't. Instead, he chose to lay it aside. Paul also talks about self-giving love in this passage. You see, when Jesus emptied himself of his privileged status and position, he chose to become a servant of all. Throughout his entire earthly ministry, he gave of himself to the needs of others. And his example for us really is a fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah's words in chapter 53 of his book. He says this, He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. You'll see it here on the screen. Keep up back there, Broza. He said this, He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at at him. No appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. We'll come back to this point a little bit later. We'll touch on it again. But Paul includes one more in his text to the Philippians. He says we need to give our life away. See, Jesus' humility ultimately delivered him all the way to the cross. I mean, his humility led to his rejection. It led to suffering. And I think we're, we're all, at least in this room, as I eyeball everybody quickly, take an inventory. Ooh, hope you're paying attention. I'm going to notice now. But, but I think we're pretty familiar with the crucifixion story, and certainly we'll get to that in future weeks. But my question is, what about your story? Where are you holding on to your life too tightly? Holding on so tightly to all the things that you want. Maybe even things we would think are really great things, like your dreams and all your aspirations. Because if following the way of Jesus means that we have to work to give our life away, we have to ask ourselves, what are the things that are holding us back? Because humility isn't as much of like this, this destination that we just go and we reach and we attain. Okay? It's not that checklist approach, right? Like, I did A, B, and C on the humility checklist, and now I am humble. But wouldn't that be great? That'd be much easier. Rather, it is an attitude, it's a posture, it's a way of living that we have to embrace. And it is an important attitude. 
It is an important way of living with God in God's kingdom. That's because humility is a huge deal. And to say that, that's kind of an odd thing to say about humility, right? Because to go around overemphasizing humility kind of puts us in a precarious spot. To make too much of a big deal about it is to kind of act like that football player who makes the really great play and gets up and starts pointing to their jersey, making it all about themselves. I picture some youngsters, I won't name names, that I know that might be attached to families here. They're pretty good at that, and I kind of like it when they're little. So when they're old and on the TV, it gets a little gross, doesn't it? But you see, like, to do that, because humility cannot be humility if it has to go around telling everyone, I'm the greatest of all time. I'm the best there's ever been. Maybe you've come across someone who's kind of talking about one of these stories, and I've, I've caught people kind of saying this, and I hope I haven't, but you could call me out. They basically give you some version of, I'm the most humble person ever. Which just saying that means that they are clearly not the most humble person ever. And so this is why, now hear this, hear this. Because we sit with a lot of scriptures, right, that point us towards humility. They warn of the dangers of being prideful. And to take those, just those scriptures... It can give us a little bit of this like, whoa, you're doing a lot of telling. We need more showing. And that's where the life of Christ balanced with the whole of the Scriptures come together. We need both of these reminders. And so this morning, we can't include a full list because you would miss lunch. And if you have something in the oven or something like that, it would be ruined. So we won't do that. But I want to hit just a couple more key passages about humility so that we can see just how huge a deal this is. Here in 1 Peter, the disciple Peter wrote about humility. And this is 1 Peter chapter 5. You'll see it on the screens. He wrote this, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. That was Peter, the disciple. Now James, the leader of the early church in Jerusalem, who just happens to be Jesus' brother, quotes a similar passage in James 4, 6. It's that same Old Testament passage that Peter did. He said, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. You see, both of these church leaders are encouraging humility, and both men quote the same passage from Proverbs. Clearly, humility made an impact on these gentlemen. Clearly, it is a huge deal. It's important. And I would think as we ponder that, God oppo- opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. No one, you know, here wants God opposing them. I don't think we're signing up for that. That sounds like a real dangerous thing to put your name on. And that's a strong enough argument in itself, probably to move us towards humility. But I want us to to go maybe just one little step further today. The psalmist in Psalm 138, which we did read earlier this morning as we began singing, says this, and it was in verse 6. I want you to see this one more time. It says, Though the Lord is great, should be on the screen for you, He cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. The idea in Psalm 138 that God distances himself from the prideful should cause us all to just sit still for a quick second. Pride and arrogance are incompatible with humility, which means... That these are attitudes we will only find far away from Christ-likeness. These are heart conditions and poor postures that will keep us at a distance from living an abundant life. Pride is serious stuff. It has the power to destroy 
you to me. And so this morning, the, the, the question we're really driving at is, is how can we better follow Christ's example of humility and deal directly with what might be keeping us from rekindling our life of faith? So we've got a little ways to go here still, but your actionable step to be pondering here this morning is this, is to surrender pride. There's a text in John 13, and maybe if you know John 13 at all, it comes to mind right away. It's the Last Supper text. It's Jesus' final Passover meal with His disciples in the upper room. And so part of this account we're going to read, but that's the setting this very seminal moment. Things are, things are coming to the end quickly for Jesus' physical life here on earth. And so we begin here in verse 4. You'll see it on the screens and you can follow along. It says this, He, that's Jesus, got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing. It should be on the screens. Thank you. And he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus continued washing feet. Now we jump down to verse 12. It says this, When he, Jesus, had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do that. We're going to pause right there. This familiar account shows Jesus performing the most humiliating and dishonoring task in his day. It was one that is reserved for the lowest household servant. Peter, known to be a, a highly outspoken member of Jesus' entourage, I'm soft selling that, by the way. He was definitely like the most outspoken, probably. He protested when Jesus came to his feet, saying, no, you shall never wash my feet. But why would he refuse? What's going on in this interaction? Well, in biblical times, the idea of a, of a student, or here, disciple, it was defined by their teacher. Pete talked about this. Two weeks ago, a little plug to go back and watch Pete from two weeks back if you missed that message. But here's the thing going on. It's that your status and honor were determined by the status and the honor of your master. So, when Peter saw his rabbi disgrace himself by washing all the nastiness and filth off of a bunch of what had to be gross dudes' feet... He wasn't simply watching Jesus humble himself. Rather, Peter's own sense of position, of honor, of importance was being brought down. Consider, if, you, if you're not sure this is a big deal, consider that in all the Gospels, they capture these accounts of the disciples arguing about who is the greatest among them in their twelve couple go so far as to getting their mother to go to Jesus and talk to him about this. Come on. I had to get mom involved. That's awkward. I'm not calling Dottie and getting her involved, okay? That's, that's strange. You see, when Peter said, 
you shall never wash my feet. This wasn't him speaking up and trying to defend Jesus' dignity or honor. That, by the way, that's what I always thought it was. Maybe, maybe that you would relate to me. I've always seen this as he was defending Jesus. I don't think that's what's going on here now. He was defending his own dignity and honor because he's essentially saying, I won't be a follower. I will not be a student of a master who washes feet because that is humiliating and it's far too beneath me. It's beneath us. You see, once we grasp Peter's real motivation, only then does Jesus' response become clearer for us. Jesus' response was, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Psalm 138, God keeps his distance from the proud. You see, by washing his feet, Jesus was actually breaking Peter's ego down. He was breaking down his arrogance and his desire for all sorts of authority and for position and for power. He was showing him the true nature of God's kingdom and then extending the opportunity for Peter to be changed into a man that could then enter God's kingdom. But the question is, will Peter surrender his pride? And if you know the last 24 hours of Christ's life, and Peter's tie in there. We have the garden. He draws a sword. We have the denial three times. It's pretty clear that pride is a really awful thing to overcome. See, the scene of Jesus washing the disciples' feet reminds us that Jesus came into the world to be disgraced. He willingly came into the world to be humiliated, to be hated, to be mocked. And it was and it still is his mission. And he can take those rejections. And we know from the gospel accounts, he did take those rejections. However, it's you and I, it's people, that we're not very good at that. You see, like Peter, we want to be on the, the positive side of what we might call the serving equation. We, we don't really mind humble acts of service and compassion as long as we, you know, get to maintain our position, our status. I call it kind of the top-down serving, right? As long as whatever the food chain is, as long as we're like a little couple rungs above whoever we're serving, we feel pretty good about that. It doesn't cost us a whole lot, but we can take care of some things. We like that. We prefer to help others. I think that this is a group, and this is not chastisement, by the way. I, I always feel bad. If you feel like I'm talking at you, it's not necessarily the case. I'm, I'm talking, because this is stuff that, that I really feel. But, you know, I think with this group, it's a good group. We prefer to help others. But we have to question ourselves. Are we only willing to help others as long as it garners our peers' approval? If it only garners our peers' respect for us? Because we've got to recall what Jesus' words were to Peter. He's saying, if you are embarrassed by having a servant, the lowliest servant, as a master, if your pride will not accept following the way of the Lord who is ridiculed and rejected, who washes dirt and grime and probably some manure type things on those streets, off people's feet, if you can't accept following someone hated by the world, then you can have no place with Jesus loved and still loves people to the point that he isn't put off by what others think. He isn't put out by a loss of status or significance in someone's eyes. As we mentioned last week on the temptation account, he knows his identity. And so Jesus emptied himself of divine privilege and faced humiliation because he so loved the world. And that's what we are to emulate. That's a tough ask, right? But I believe that's the authentic call of Jesus in the life of those who would say, I want to be part of that family. So if you're caught in a season 
where God you know, seems at a distance. And you, you're becoming more and more aware that, that you need a time of rekindling. Here's a couple questions for you to consider here as we wrap this up this morning. The question is, will you journey with Christ and die to yourself? Surrendering your pride, even to the point that you follow closely when people reject you, when people blame you, when people despise you. Are you willing to surrender your reputation? Will you surrender your position? How about your brand? Would you surrender your posture of always defending yourself? All in order to then pursue the truest humility modeled in Christ-likeness? See, one of the, the, the most difficult lessons that I, that I continue to learn, quite frankly, is that humility is really only real humility if it costs you something. For many of us, it is for me, <laughs> the cost is usually my well-hidden pride masquerading as humbleness. But, I think there's good news here today. You know Peter's story? He is eventually kind of re-established as the rock. Peter's an early church leader. He's one of the top dogs. Okay, so we'll celebrate him because he didn't get to. Eventually he got knocked down enough. There's good news for us, folks. It's that if we will surrender, if we will do the hard work okay, of releasing our pride, if we will then place ourselves in God's hands, then I trust that the Lord of heaven and earth is faithful then to refashion us into someone fit be in his presence, in his family. And so this morning, I don't know exactly what your struggle with pride is. Pride is a strange thing like that. It comes out in very different ways. Next week, we're going to talk about maybe some paths for stilling ourselves to deal with such things as pride. But that's the path this morning for you here and now is to consider, are you even willing to surrender your pride? We think of washing feet as this very, and we're Church of God folk, even though we don't necessarily do it here. I grew up, we practiced foot washing on Monday, Thursdays, right? And I think that practice is still good. I, I know some wedding ceremonies actually have foot washing as part of them. An act of service is good. But I think in 21st century where we have shoes and socks, it doesn't quite get to the heart of what's going on. And so this week, if there is a challenge, it's to consider not just are you willing, but then where are you serving that actually costs you something. I'm not talking about, you know, $10 helping somebody on the street. Most of us have $10. Not everybody. Most of us. I'm talking about, like, does it cause others to think less of you? That's a cost. Oof. For the sake of loving and serving others, is it costing you some street cred? Is it costing you friendships? Because you know you're doing what's right to pursue Christ's way. That's our 21st century closest comparable to what Jesus was getting at. Then go and do likewise. Now that you know this, we're all on the hook. It's a little scary, and it's quite a challenge. Let's do the work of being faithful people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful as always. Every time we get